Good evening. Uh, my name is Petra Wright. I am the gallery director of Gloria Delson Contemporary Arts, also known as GDCA Gallery. Uh, tonight, I am delighted to welcome you to our virtual closing reception of our two May 2021 exhibitions, a group show entitled Resonance and our solo exhibition, Cynthia M. Swan, Deja Vu. Uh, both exhibits are on display through May 31st. Um, although technically tomorrow is the last gallery day, I may be persuaded to see some people on Monday, uh, the 31st, just let me know. Um, masks are required, but we are taking live uh, appointments and walk-ins, so I hope to see you soon. Um, all the works are for sale. So if something grabs you, please contact us. Uh, and to that point, there is an exhibition catalog on our website. The website is gdcagallery.com. And if you go to the tab that says current exhibition and you scroll right past the installation uh, pictures, you will find every artist and every artwork listed with all the details that you need to know. And then please reach out to us anytime. Um, so, we are going to begin by taking you through a slideshow presentation, moving front to back through the gallery and into each artist's section, at which point the artists will then join us and speak about their work. In a few cases when the artists cannot be with us, I will read their statement and try to take their place. Um, at the end of the presentation, we are going to have a Q&A. So, if you have any questions for any of the artists during this show, uh, type it into your chat window. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a chat window. And then at the very end, uh, we will go and look through all the questions and field them to the artists so that they can answer them for you. Um, that's it. So with that, let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. Everybody hold your breath. Petra's doing technology up. Oh, there we go. Share. Aha. Let's see if this works. Okay. So this is, um, these are our two exhibits, Resonance and Cynthia M. Swan Deja Vu. Participating artists in Resonance are Nurit Avasar, Adria Becker, Ezra Behar, Suzanne Belcher, Anthony Caldwell, Terry Dryden, Sylvia H. Golden, Suki Kuss, Ryan Lane, Kathy Madrigal, Richard Reiner, and Stephen Schubert, and of course, Cynthia Ann Swan. So we're going to start with resonance. Um, and here are some of my thoughts on the title of the show. Resonance now, the ability to evoke or suggest images memories and emotions. 12 notable artists converge to create a visual, a visio-emotional symbiosis in painting, mixed media, collage, digital mixed media, and photo painting. The exhibit aims to elicit personal connections with the viewer by means of color, texture, movement, shape, and content, immediate impact with lasting impression. What does it mean to resonate? What has the power to make a lasting impression? What will come back to us time and again, move us to the point of being unable to forget? What will haunt us in our dreams? What will surprise us, allow us to form neuro pathways never traveled before? We cannot unsee what we have truly seen. Once moved, we can't unfeel the purity of color, the courage of a stroke, the emotional capture of mood, the awakening through layers of meaning we had not yet caught or that we forgot. We are changed. 
So those are my thoughts on resonance. And uh, with that, we have arrived at our first artist, which is Terry, who is Terry Dryden. <laughs> And we're going a little bit out of order here because Terry is joining us from the East Coast and she's three hours ahead. So um, I hope that is okay. Um, so Terry is a mixed media artist who has really made her mark in the collage field. Her work is inspired by her studies in Japan, the Japanese culture overall, and the philosophy of Wabi Sabi which loosely paraphrasing celebrates all that is impermanent, imperfect, and incomplete. The works we are showing this month are part of her Solace of Open Spaces series. They are artist painted papers collaged onto wood panels. And her statement about this series reads, the need to simplify has become an important factor in my day-to-day -day living. In my latest series, The Solace of Open Spaces, I continue to explore the concept of spaciousness, breathing room, high ceilings, the area between the lines of the poem. It's that place you go to when you become still, quiet, calm. My process of uniting color, shape, line, and texture focuses on finding that place by creating complex surfaces only to cover them leaving only what is necessary. And with that, I wanted to welcome Terry Dryden. Thank you so much, Petra. I appreciate you. Uh, this new series is um, very near and dear to me. Um, as you said in my statement, I have um, really needed to simplify in my life. I think a lot of us as we age, we want to pare down, we want to make things simple, but it's not, how do you create art though, when you're trying to simplify? How do you pare down to the essence, but you don't remove the poetry? Um, and how do you keep things uh, clean and unencumbered without sterilizing? So for me, it implies a limited palette and uh, keeping conspicuous images to a minimum. Um, so my process is very intuitive. I, with the concept of spaciousness in my mind, and I actually, I learned a wonderful word when I was in Japan. It's called yutori, and it means spaciousness. And spaciousness is not, it's not necessarily the definition of it, but it is the idea and the feeling of it. And, um, and I just think it's such a beautiful word. So when I am creating my work, I am subconsciously thinking about spaciousness and wabi-sabi, things that are um, rough around the edges and, uh, textured and spacious. And um, so I just basically keep wanting to go deeper and deeper. And I want to uh, reduce the information. After I keep applying these papers, I want to reduce the information while at the same time keeping a connective tissue that somehow binds the elements into a meaningful whole. And that's what I hope that I have accomplished with this new series that I have at your gallery. Thank you. You have. <laughs> oh, I, I adore that. Thank you. And, and um, I adore the work and, and the, the philosophy behind it. And yes, that is absolutely the trick, which I think you, you are, you know, you're in the zone, you're doing exactly what you described of, of walking that balance of, of paring down and preserving the essence, the core, without losing the, po losing the poetry. And I remember actually, I think somebody told me that the, one of the definitions of poetry was being able to communicate an idea or a feeling with the, the least, amount of words possible. 
So it's actually directly in line to what you're saying. So um, yes, it's a haiku is mm -hmm. a perfect example of yeah. wabi-sabi and simplicity and utori. Yeah. Yeah, I love, thank you so much for that gift. I wrote it down, Utori. It's yeah. going into my um, imaginary cocktail party conversation. <laughs> um, wonderful. Terry, thank you. I'm so excited to finally oh, be with you. Thank you. That was part of my introduction that I skipped because of my opening nerve jitters. Um, I, I've been wanting to work with you for a long time and I'm so happy that we finally have you on board. So yeah. uh, thank you. Well, you um, go forth into the night, three hours ahead. <laughs> I'm gonna stick it out as long as I can, but it is about, oh, it's a little after nine here. It's one o'clock. My husband's gonna bring me up in a few minutes. So I'll, uh, I'll sit around and listen to the other artists who I'm very excited about showing with. There's a bunch of really fine, fine artists in your cadre, my lady. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So we'll we'll see you. Um, so our next, oops, here we go. My favorite bonking sound. Now everything will go fine. I was nervous before, and now I got the bonking sound. Everything's going to be great. Here we go. That was Terry Dryden. Thank you, my dear. Our next artist is Ezra Behar. Um, Oh, see, and I'm on the wrong page. There we go. So Ezra Behar, Ezra cannot be with us tonight. So he asked me to speak on his behalf. Um, this particular piece I just showed was a detail of the piece you see on the left called An Unusual Sight. Um, for, for a lot of you who might not be familiar with Ezra, I'm going to start with a little bit of a bio. Ezra Behar is a scientist and professional artist from Mexico City. His art is informed by his experience of a temporary vision loss and 30 years of scientific experience. Ezra searches for alternative realities in paintings that are provocative, energetic, and innovative. Over the past decade, his work has been shown in more than 30 solo and group exhibitions in the US and abroad. Um, he has also given me two little blurbs about the two paintings he has on display. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the medium, which is really interesting because it is essentially a work that is, is falling into a new definition, which is post-digital. So hang tight, it's going to be very interesting. So first we'll start on the left, an unusual sight. Landscape inspired by a rare shaped Tory pine tree with a sunset seen in the background. This painting was created after a long walk on the magnificent Tory Pine State Park located in North San Diego. The scene shows an aurora like sky with highlights, which highlights the strange aesthetics of the tree, bringing tranquility and peace to the viewer. Peace on the right, Fifth Avenue. Inspired by the glamour found in some circles and in large cities, this requires an extensive social fabric to depict and promote. This colorful abstract painting shows the image of a woman with black hair and a bare black torso looking back. She is standing at what used to be one of the busiest streets in New York City, Fifth Avenue, a luxurious stretch of retail in the country a place always welcoming, steady stream of fashion mavens, but now during the pandemic may give the world a different impression. So let's talk a little bit about the medium. Yes, this is acrylic on canvas. However, there's more to it than that. This is essentially work that falls into what I call a hybrid category yet being created, which is a post digital. It's a combination of digital elements and original painting. And Ezra was so kind to send me a little kind of a, not a manifesto, but kind of some guideline bullet points about this new work. And I'm finding it, it's popping up more and more in artworks that I'm encountering. So I'm really excited that we're kind of on the forefront of starting to exhibit it and, um, I'm excited to see where it goes. 
So what they're saying is that the, the, the hybrid experience or the post-digital condition, post-digital artworks, describe a condition of artworks and things that are conceptually and physically shaped by the internet and the digital process, but that are, that are taking their language for granted, yet they manifest in material form of objects. The second point was it find, it's artwork that finds its artistic expression in works that are both deeply informed by digital technologies and artworks and networks, sorry, but that are crossing the boundaries between the media and their final form. So what that ultimately means is that there's a digital component to the composition of these paintings. They are ultimately executed in acrylic on canvas, but there's a digital component. So I just wanna say, as I quote one of my heroes, watch this space. So um, that was Ezra Behar. And we are moving on to Adria Becker, another artist I have been excited to learn about and work with. This we are seeing right now is a, a detail from one of her paintings on display called Tree of a Different Color. Adria is also new to our GDCA family and um, she may be new to some of our audience. So I wanted to just give you a very quick introduction. Adria has served as a past executive director for and on the art panel of Artist Co-op 7, where she teaches right brain figure drawing. She is currently on the board of directors of the San Fernando Valley Arts and Cultural Center. She is also a fellow curator. And in addition to being a full-time artist, she teaches oil painting at the American Jewish University in Los Angeles. So with that, I would like to welcome Adria Becker. Hi, Adria. Hi, Petra. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, the work that we're showing um, in the gallery right now um, is um, in response to my concern about climate change. And by using the title, The Trees Are Melting, which came from um, a, a friend of mine who's a, a songwriter and that was the title of a song she wrote. It really touched me and I thought I would try to put that into paint. Um, the, the method that I use really does kind of lend itself to um, the melting metaphor. Um, I, I mix and pour oil paint, um, take a bunch of jars and a bunch of <laughs> oil different colors, lots of paint thinner and other mediums and shake them up pour them in the direction that I would ideally like them to go, but they just take off and do their own thing and start to melt and, you know, blend, but melt. And um, then the, the uh, more solid shapes are two, are supportive shapes. And um, you pick these three out, uh, particularly out of my body of work. And I think you did a terrific job. They, they seem to work really well together. I would not have thought of it myself, but you did. So that's your curating talent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Well, I was just really, really blown away by the the vibrancy and the, the intensity and the vitality of the color. That's kind of what what stopped me in my tracks, and I couldn't stop thinking about, it, especially the piece on the right when tree, the trees are melting. Number two. So that's actually also what started the whole idea of the title of resonance, which is it just resonated with me. I couldn't unsee it. I couldn't unthink it. I kept thinking about this piece. And that, that's kind of how my curatorial journey sometimes begins, is there's a, there's a piece, there's an idea, there's a color of feeling. And then trying to match this is a very delicate thing because all these three are divas and they um you know it you you have to be very careful who you put in a dressing room <laughs> so, you know you want them to to be equal in their strength and, and and their beauty yet not you know overshadow or not clash and and i felt like we found the perfect three divas in these trees and All right. thank, thank you, you. You're welcome. Absolutely. The other thing that that uh, kind of resonated with me that was that you said in one of your statements that you love to draw the figure in a non-traditional way. 
but I felt that that really also applied to these trees. There's, there's a, an imaginary suggested way that you're rendering these trees that, that brings me into the narrative. I, I mentioned to you sort of the twisted aspect of the, the trees on the left. And you said that that was for you very much in uh, sort of a metaphor for the agedness of the trees, how much they've endured, how long they've been around and yet they're still supporting this plumage. So um, yes, I love the treatment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm all about the color. As you can tell, it's all about <laughs> her. <laughs> love it, love it. Thank you, Adria, very much. Oops, there's the boinking sound. Here we go. Our next artist is Kathy Madrigal. Uh, Kathy cannot be here tonight, so I'm going to be reading some things and explaining some of her work. Um, this is a detail of one of my favorite paintings of hers called um, After the Rain. Um, in this exhibit, Kathy is exhibiting five different paintings from select series. And I asked her to describe to me what unifies them. And here's what she said. All of these paintings are action paintings with the intent to create texture and sense of atmosphere. I used multiple layers of oils and wax to create this effect. I see these pieces as celestial, water-like, and airy. There's something, they're soothing and intricate, and there's just enough to be able to see something new in them every time you look. And then she, she wrote a little blurb about each of the paintings, so I will take you into the next slide after this. So on the left, after the rain, is a memory of living through 28 days of torrential downpour in Australia. The rich landscape was darkened by the constant flooding. At times, the skies would open over the ocean and a setting sun would light the clouds on fire, but only briefly and until the next squall came through. Not listening, a multi-layered painting consisting of oil and wax was created as an emotional release. Painting for me can be a response to outside stimulus where instead of vocalizing my frustration or opinion, I let paint materials be my voice and hence my therapy. Sea of Thing, anywhere I visit tide pools, I am captivated by the clarity of the water and the plethora of creatures that live off the pools alone. They can appear to be so still, yet I know they are creating and expending energy constantly, just like all living things. The contrast of textures, colors, and movements are spellbinding. This is my homage to the little creatures. Winds are not, and when the wind changes, were created together. They are typical of my paint application and my editing process, adding and removing layers, revealing a textural landscape of color. Winds are not somehow reminded me of tying a tie. When the wind changes has an atmospheric quality. It's like you're lying on your back in a field, looking up at the ever-changing levels of clouds, chasing them as you would chase flying dandelions. So I wanted to share that with you because she can express it so much better than I can. Um, what always strikes me is the, the delicacy of her emotion and sentiment that she's able to communicate in such a fearless and raw way by the materials that she chooses. And, um, she never plays nice. She's always completely authentically herself and um, unbridled and I love that. I wish she could be here with us tonight. You would love her, um, but you will meet her another time very soon. This brings us to Suki Kuss. So Suki, this is a detail from um, a vertical stack of four different paintings from her Asian quilt series. Uh, she is showing works from three different series tonight. So I'm going to go back and forth a little bit. Um, the Asian quilt series, which you see here, the When Women Were Birds series, and then also a autonomous panel, the Music City, that is combined with another Asian quilt. Um, 
I wanted to share a poem that Suki attaches to the back of her paintings, especially in the, in specifically to the When We Were Birds series. It is by Terry Tempest Williams. Once upon a time, when women were birds, there was a simple understanding that to sing at dawn and to sing at dusk was to heal the world through joy. The birds still remember what we have forgotten, that the world is meant to be celebrated. So I wish Suki could be here tonight because she is, um, you know, there's so many facets to her work and she can speak to it so eloquently. I always say that she needs to create a Rosetta Stone to help her fans and her viewers identify and translate all the different poetic and metaphoric layers and, and meanings that she puts in there. And it occurred to me that, um, you know, Suki is really all about mysteries and secrets and passions. And this is going to become a new facet of the night. So everybody prepare yourselves. Here's a little fun fact I learned about Suki that I did not know before. Suki's dream and much of her young adult life was preparing to be a professional jockey. And it was a career that was ultimately cut short by an addiction of skydiving. <laughs> so again, mysteries and passions, because this work is, you know, she, this work is so delicate and transcendent and she is such a daredevil. So um, I just love how fascinating all of you are. And so this is gonna be a theme throughout the night. So get yours ready. I wanna know a fun fact about all of you by the time this is through. Um, so that was Suki. I wish you were here, darling. Our next artist is Sylvia Goulden. Um, Sylvia is displaying five pieces from her Power as One series. And Sylvia has asked me to speak on her behalf. So I'm going to uh, read a statement that she created for this. I created the series of monoprints as my thoughts reflected on the strength we gain while working and creating together with close friends. After completing two or three of my pieces, I became engrossed with the idea of expressing the importance of women uniting to become more powerful. I created more than nine pieces in this series with the thought of exhibiting them as grid. Some of them have sold, so we have five. To further express my thought, I wrote this haiku. Gathering as one mind, friends through the seasons of life, dancing their power. So this was the point uh, where I would love to discuss the work with Sylvia. Um, there's so many layers to this work and the theme is so personal to her because I'm always impressed with the incredible tight-knit circle of creatives that she has surrounded herself with. And she is such a source of light to her friends. And I guess it resonates very deeply with me because I personally have also been the beneficiary of some very profound mental relationships uh, in family and friends and mentors and teachers. And um, so I'm very moved by this series. And I thank Sylvia for creating this series. And I, and I thank all of you amazing mentors and women's, women's, women's folks <laughs> and men's folks that you are, you know who you are. And um, so thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. This brings us to an actual live artist, Anthony Caldwell. <laughs> um, Anthony is exhibiting five of his photo paintings. And it's in a series that we call his Impressionism series. Um, we're going to double back on what I touched upon earlier, which is again, sort of the, the new frontier of art, which is being explored, creating hybrids of uh, more established artistic disciplines, in this case, photography and digital. But we'll get to that. 
we'll get to that. So uh, by way of introduction, I wanted to read from an essay about Anthony's work because it's so eloquent and I, I you know, don't want to compete with that. Um, Caldwell's current body of work is comprised of alluring urban scenes that explore the transient effects of light and color with a photorealistic quality. Natural light sets the stage of each composition with sunset and twilight serving as his favorite times of day. Vibrant changes occur with a surrounding atmosphere as the sun descends just below the horizon. The sky gradually transforms into deep shades of blue. Sources of natural and synthetic light begin to offset the impending darkness with radiant illumination. Shadows become elongated and dramatic as nightfall settles in. Architectural structures appear mysterious and stoic with brilliant flashes of light peering through the sky. Emblazoned with color and palpable energy, Caldwell deftly brings these subtle details to life. So with that, I would like to welcome Anthony Caldwell. Anthony. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. <laughs> oh, no, that was that was great. Um, there's really not a whole lot more I can I can say on top of that, but I will I'll try a little bit more. So this series, uh, there are kind of two aspects to it. So I'm going to come back to the second aspect in a second, which is the one that part of what Petra was touching on about the uh, contemporary kind of combining digital and more traditional methodologies of pursuing art. This series started me on a long path of photographing architecture in various cities in various conditions. And uh, as, as it says in the piece, twilight is one of my favorite moments because there's so much wonderful transitional light happening, uh, whether it be sunrise or sunset, uh, it really doesn't matter. It can be uh, quite dramatic and quite wonderful. And this series kind of looks at two ways of thinking about the perspective of a city at night uh, or in the transitional periods of becoming night. Uh, the, uh, the picture or the piece on the uh, right, Night Street, uh, it's looking up as we often do when we walk down streets. But the thing about that street is that uh, it becomes very, uh, I don't know, almost ghostly as it, it moves out of frame, that you have impressions of spaces and colors and lights. But if the next morning somebody asks you to tell in any kind of detail, tell you about it, except for maybe a sign that you remembered, you probably don't remember all the details. Uh, the one on the left is from a perspective looking down as are the rest of the pieces in this show, uh, which is another interesting way to look at it, not a common way that we look at it. I became inspired uh, on the roof of a building uh, one evening, looking down at the ribbons of light that make up our streets, how the buildings almost act as uh, ways of blocking light coming up and the streets are these brilliant ribbons that are just glowing. And then the buildings are these kind of spooky outlines that you get a little bit of an idea about. And it, it really struck me as another way to look at the cities and the places that we live in. Uh, and part of this kind of coming back to the, the, the first part uh, that I wanted to circle back to was that, you know, some of these are traditional photography and then they are essentially uh, manipulated inside of digital application. So when I first started, uh, the word manipulation in a digital application was a very bad thing to say about your artwork. Uh, today, of course, it's, it's an entire movement, but I think it actually does open up some tools and avenues that are rather difficult to get in any other way. You can explore playing with lighting in a way that is approaching natural, but it, you can kind of push it a little bit. So it's a little bit beyond. I always like, um, pushing my images to the point where they're still natural uh, to a large degree, but there's kind of an essence of uh, otherworldliness that kind of wraps around them. And you can kind of go there, uh, you know, just with pushing, pushing it just a little bit here and there. And so that's why I like actually merging of the two tools. I'm, I always love cameras. My father was an artist. He photographed everything. So I spent my informative years tailing around with him as he photographed shipyards and every other thing you could imagine and really got a respect for what a camera can do, but combined with today's tools, you can do you can do so much more and explore it in so many different ways. I have had single images that I've made four or five works out of just a single image that I'm able to pull out different compositions and different viewpoints. 
So, um, you know, I think that's that's mostly what I have to say about it, except to say I'm so honored to be with all of you tonight. Uh, your, all of your works are just amazing, and it was so amazing to be in, in the gallery last week. So, well, very exciting. Thank you, Petra. Thank you, Anthony. And also, I'm going to um, thank you again, even though I will thank you later for always being my holding my hand and, and hosting this webinar and down to the point of teaching me key point so I could create this slideshow. None of this uh, would have been possible without Anthony Caldwell and, and is entirely the fault of Suzanne Belcher, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> um, Anthony, thank you. So I wanna, I wanna, I'm not quite done with you yet because um, I wanted to see, and maybe you can take position to this later in the Q and A's, but I wanted to give you some of these other points from that manifesto I mentioned about this, this post digital, these guidelines or, or attributes and see how you feel about them. Um, so I already mentioned that they, uh, it describes a condition of, of uh, artworks and things conceptually physically shaped by the internet but that manifest in a digital, in, in a digital, uh, sorry, a physical material form. Come on, Petra. Um, but it also describes the embeddedness of the digital in the objects, images, and structures. And this is where I wondered about you that we encounter on a daily basis, that we understand how we then understand ourselves in relation to them. So I'm just wondering how you feel the, the digital tools, the, this whole toolbox that has been kind of set at your feet, how that has informed your artistic decisions uh, when you photograph? Oh. Or is that something that applies really in post that's not part of the composition of a shot? Well, when I was doing a number of these images originally, they were photographed in a DSLR. Uh, you know, you had to take into account what the limitations of the digital tools might be. In short, uh, if you wanted to really push something that you knew software just couldn't do it, uh, you had to then adjust it in the camera uh, to make sure that that actually happened. Today, the tools are very different. Uh, they don't, uh, and that was actually a big problem in my opinion. You know, if we're talking in the 90s, early mm -hmm. 2000s, a lot of the imagery that was being produced, uh, you could look at it and go, I know what program made that, right? Uh, because the, the tools forced a certain kind of viewpoint or a certain type of characterization of the imagery uh, that was very recognizable if you use them. And so uh, now the tools have gotten so much better that uh, they're kind of invisible to me. I know I have a toolkit. I use a variety, wide variety of software, depending on what I need to have happen. And I think uh, now, and of course, now we have digital cameras. So I have a digital camera and it's in essence, a little mini computer. It has many of the different types of uh, technology to manipulate imagery that I would do on a desktop computer, but it does it inside of the camera. So now the camera, and the desktop tools have become one. They're, they're indistinguishable in my opinion. So I know that if I shoot a certain way, I can, I can address it in post and on the desktop. If I really wanna push something in the camera, it works out fine, I can do that too. Um, and so then you produce these, these digital works that get turned back into physical works, which again is really interesting uh, because what, when somebody uh, years ago would ask me, so what's the original? I'd say, I don't know, what do you want, right? So do you want it, you want it the size of a building? Do you want it the size of a, a you know, postcard? Uh, it's whatever media we can get it on, which is quite extensive. And now if you throw in the, the whole new movement, which we've talked about a little bit of NFTs, uh, non-punchable tokens, which is, we're not gonna get into it, but that, that puts it in a whole nother layer of what you can have a digital original. Mm -hmm. So it's now all becoming all together. I'm, I'm gonna have to, because my brain is going to implode at that point. <laughs> I 
literally that's where it just goes ink <laughs> Mac, that, that is such a huge conversation and we will definitely be uh leaning on you to lead us into that conversation because you'll I, need more bottles of wine though i will at least need to have one too <laughs> I will need, no i need to but yes let's let's put a, a, a footnote, a pin into that conversation. Um, the last thing, I, again, I wanted to say, even though I think you touched upon it already, is your treatment of light. The, that, that harkens back to the Dutch masters of that, that intensive uh, juxtaposition that's called chiaroscuro, that just light and dark and transitioning in a very small area from one to the other is so dramatic. I just, um, I love the, 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 painterly quality that you created. So um, thank you for sharing this, this series with me. I really adore it. Thank you. Ah, boinking sound, little boinking sound. That, my friends, was Anthony Caldwell. Our next artist is Nurit Avasar, And unfortunately, Nurit cannot be with us tonight. So um, I will have to read from her statement. Um, she is exhibiting one of her mixed media pieces on canvas called A Different Tune. And I'm going to read a little bit about her, her process so that you can understand the texture that you're looking at, as well as then uh, the narrative about the piece itself. My practice is rooted in the process art movement. I paint, glue, sand, and tear away multiple layers of paintings. I often collage rust, plastic, fabric, and other materials to that compound surface. This particular mixed media piece includes paper, cheesecloth, oil, rust, and acrylic paints, graphite, and color pencils. The rigorous process of tearing finished paintings, adding and rebuilding layers of unlikely materials in order to merge the distressed surface into one coherent image, metaphorically, alludes to the power play throughout history. It is about forces that tear at the fabric of societies and the creation of a new reality from the old fragments. It invokes the re-examination of cultural legacies and historical events and their weight on the present. A different tune is part of the Elemental Energies series in which most of the paintings are cont contemplative, sorry, uh, contemplative and reflective. I was thinking about the effects of historical events. However, while creating this piece, the canvas was just bursting with joyful colors, especially the yellows and the different shades of green. I decided to name it a different tune because of its optimism and its cheerful energy. And I like to say always that Nurit is one of the masters of the irresistible surface. It's uh, very hard not to want to touch it. Um, but uh, it's also really notable and interesting, as so often, to, to kind of see the, the, the journeys and the stages that artists move through. Nurit started out as a um, graphic designer and illustrator, very specific tight, realistic work. But I really find that I think she's found her calling in the communication, the emotional communication in these abstract pieces, where she is emotionally reflecting her reality in a visceral, evocative, and abstract way. Anyways, I uh, invite you to come see her work this month. And um, many other months as all of these artists are part of our family. So um, you can always come and revisit them with us. Uh, so that is Nurit Avasar leading us into another flesh and bone artist, Richard Reiner. This is a detail of um, Richard's painting called Somewhere Off the Pacific Coast. Richard is exhibiting four of his abstracted seascapes this month. And I asked him to tell me if there was a unifying element between them, between the different vistas. And this is what he said. The universal question for me is spiritual. In this natural world, what is my part along this journey and how do I contribute to it? Do I live in a state of gratitude and honor it in an artistic way? 
I'm not really sure how I can truly describe or articulate the feelings I derive from the beauty of the environment that I pass through and visit. It's humbling, cutting through all the chaos and horror we humans put upon others. For me, it's a one-to-one -one relationship I experience and try to share. My interpretation and words are hopefully expressed through paint, brushes, canvas, and whatever else I can reach for in the moment. So with that, I'd like to welcome Richard Reiner. Hi, Richie. Hey, you hi. <laughs> Thanks, Petra. And uh, well, it's really exciting to be part of the exhibit and with so many other artists because I always, I go to these shows and I usually never look at my work at all. I go right in and I start looking at all the other people and I start, you know, moving in close, moving out close. And, you know, sometimes the painting invites me, the other times the, the painting and the work will just push me back and say, look from afar. So I really derive a lot of pleasure and a lot of inspiration from looking at artists and uh, how they interpret what they see and what they feel. And uh, it's, uh, it's it's always beautiful. I mean, it's, you can go to museums for that too, but you don't have to. You can go to the gallery and see quite a bit of uh, people who have quite a bit of things to say and how they say it. So it's quite unique. Um, yeah, I mean, most of my work, this is, a, this is a, I revisited this kind of, uh, this palette and also this uh, kind of theme and genre over and over again, because it's something that I've always had in juxtaposition with just the way I feel in, in the world. You know, I just feel that the uh, human beings and the, uh, how we walk through life, it's a, it is, it's a lot of chaos. It's a, human beings not really being human a lot of times. And I look for nature, you know, for a lot of answers. It sounds kind of corny, but, you know, I look at people and I don't see people change much, you know, even if they're good people, you know, um, there's always a process and an evolution in oneself. And to get complacent um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a trap, no matter what it might be. But you know, purely, you know, I look at, you know, what's remarkable about nature and why I'm driven and drawn to it. And it's the fact that it's always changing. It's never repeats itself. It's something different. And if it's a bad turbulent day and it's a horrendous snowstorm or, you know, winds and things like that, it's always changing. Tomorrow could be a beautiful blue sunny day and birds are singing, you know, and uh, I, I look at it like, how does nature, you know, uh, nature accepts what is, you know, and does with what that moment is and lives in the moment, lives in the present. And I, as a, you know, in the other world of it, uh, I have sometimes I live in the past, you know, or I'm future tripping. You know, but I, it brings me back to try to get to what's in front of me now. What do I want to say? What do we want to do? Uh, how is my creative process affected by my environment, either being in a city, in the country, or being out in the outdoors on the top of a mountain and nobody's there? And um, it's a dance I always do. You know, if I get really um, agitated with what's going on in uh, the world or what's going on in my world or what's going on in my home or whatever, I find myself take a walk, meditate through nature and, med and nature always brings me back to a place of balance and peace for me. Um, so I, I, I find uh, I'm always drawn back to nature. How do I, how do I give my homage to what nature is, you know? So a lot of the paintings you might see and say, my God, it's a little, it's morbid or it's a little moody or depressing. And I always look at it, even if it's depressing, there's always a little hint of blue or sunshine or something within it. So no matter how bad today is, so what? Tomorrow's another day, you know? And it's, it's also my own attitude, you know? I have choices. I could either have a bad day when I wake up and make it more of a miserable day, or I can sit there and go, I'm gonna make it a good day. And if things around me make it turbulent, I can sit there and move to the side and find some kind of quiet about what that is. And um, so my paintings take on a lot of different um, forms. I might take a look at a photograph that I've taken that I've been on a, a trip somewhere or hiking or fly fishing somewhere. 
And um, I'll just stop whatever I'm doing and I'll just, just look and observe. I'll try to capture that moment, you know, and, but before I capture that moment, I sit with that moment. I sit with what that's going on. If it's a hot day, if it's a cool day, if it's a, I feel the warmth, I feel the cool, I feel the rain on me. I want to feel that because when I go back into the studio, I can't really recreate what I see in nature. So when I do paint out in plein air, it's different. When I come home, I can't replicate the feeling I had when I was there in the middle of a river somewhere watching, you know, wildlife come down to the water and visit. So, you know, for me, I might start off with a painting and I go, this is really cool. I really, really enjoyed this, this place that I visited and I'll start laying local color in and I'll start blocking things in. And as I start working with it, I'll find that I have thick paint here and thin paint here and I'm looking at it and then I look at the painting and the painting I let dictate to me where I'm gonna go with it. I'm, I start off with an idea, but I'd say probably 90% of the time, it looks nothing like what I started with. And uh, it could be very realistic. And by the time I'm done, it's, I've abstracted it or I've minimized it and edited a lot of things out. Um, I might be working with brushes, you know, and big brushes and then go in and start refining what I wanted to, you know, allow to peek out at us or whatever. And then I might just take palette knives and things like that. I'll take branches from being outdoors and I'll hit the paint with it. And then I'll just sit there and I'll look at the canvas. It might be a really nice painting. And I'm looking at it and I go, it's really nice, but it says nothing to me. It gives me nothing. It emotes very little, but it looks aesthetic. But to me, as an artist, I'm looking at it to give something back. If I'm putting something in and I'm not getting it, I'll lay it, let it sit. I might let it sit for a few years. I might go back into it. Of course, it's not going to be what I started to do with it. So the work, I guess, and I'm, maybe I'm rambling on is just like life. I hope I keep evolving. I hope the paintings evolve. And a lot of times I get to a point in a painting and I go, wow. Uh, I step back and I go, it hit me and it was nothing that I wanted to do. And I'll just stop. And a lot of people might sit there and go, that painting is not finished. And it's finished for me. It's for you to complete it, you know? Uh, and hopefully you get into the painting enough where you have that experience where you, these paintings are go in there and discover something about who you are. Go in and discover and find something that, you know, hits you in the heart, uh, not very cerebral. I really pretty much go on very visceral, very gut level. I also let my art kind of become like when I'm working on it, let the art evolve, you know, from it. You know, sometimes it's art by chance, sometimes it's by design, but most of the time it keeps on changing. And these transitions that take place, you know, it's really weird. I'm really an upbeat guy. And a lot of people say, my God, these, these are, aren't they a little depressing? I said, no, are you? You know, um, I know some of the things that, you know, I have a cousin who's a painter and he's really depressed and he paints really bright, vibrant things. But, you know, everybody has a different take on what, you know, what this is, why I enjoy so much about um, paint, canvas, the tools. A lot of times I'll do rag paintings. I'll actually get in with rags and just start feeling the paint. I want to feel the paint. I want to feel that. You know, that um, if it's on a landscape, I want to feel that place I'm visiting. And uh, hopefully something raw is coming out of it. And, uh, but again, with everything, even if it's moody, even if it's turbulent, I want you to see that there's always calm, there's always peace. It's going to change. So whatever is beautiful today might not be beautiful tomorrow. How do you sit with that? How do you live with that? And then if it's really bad, to know that tomorrow will be another day and that another day might be just a really magical day. So don't get too stuck on um, whatever those things that you're in, either it's too good or it's too bad, it will change. You know, so anyhow, I, I, maybe I'm getting a little too much of my 60s mind back. <laughs> I may be revisiting a little bit too much of that. Not but, at all, um, so. not at all. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for being welcome with that. And that's exactly, I think, what 
you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff I always love talking about is like really what's, what's underneath, what's the process. And I'm going to get into some of that later as well. I have more things I want to ask, but I'm going to save them for the Q and A, I think. Um, but you've already touched on so many great things. So thank you so, so much. Um, and I love the tempestuousness of your paintings. That's why I chose them. <laughs> Um, so not at all tempestuous, however, in this particular series is Suzanne Belcher. Um, so this is a detail from a uh, new mixed media painting called A Window in Time. Um, this work is a continuation of a theme that Suzanne found herself exploring during the pandemic in response to observing sort of our new cyber reality and as well as a need for self-healing through joy and, and a playfulness and approach. So um, Suzanne and I decided we were going to split up the two statements about the series and um, I hope I got the right one. I'm not sure I'm gonna read one and then she's going to read the other. Um, so, the first statement is, we all know that life isn't a fairy tale, and it doesn't always have a happy ending. However, we as humans, going through the emotional and physical challenges and surviving what our world has been going through this last year plus, need to engage in escapism fantasies from time to time just to get through the day. And... Um, the other statement will come from Suzanne with that. So I want to welcome the lady herself, Suzanne Belcher. Are you with us? I am. Great. Hi, Petra. As always, I'm so happy to be here again with um, <clears throat> all of these wonderful, talented artists and to hear their stories. A uh, couple, three people that haven't been with us that I know very well. So it, it's, it's always exciting. Um, I think my other statement, which I'd written first and then I changed it, um, I think it says, sky travelers in cyberland find a happy landing on Fantasy Island, joining with old friends and new. Looking back through a window in time, glimpses of a life past and a life anew that await if you just believe it's true. This escapism whims whimsical series approaches an end as our world begins to heal and open up again, coming together as survivors with stories to share that become legends as they are told and retold over and over again. Um, these two pieces uh, obviously are the new pieces in the series, the, the last, uh, the first pieces that you saw, Joyful Reunions and Homecoming, um, have now been joined by A Window in Time and um, Landing on Fantasy Island. Excuse me. <clears throat> I think I need a little sip of wine or water or something. Anyway, um, both of these pieces were done as joyful predictions, actually, that have now become beginning to come true of good things to come, sort of like what Richard was, was talking about. Uh, we can have our bleak days. Don't give up, folks, if you're in that place, because the next day could be really wonderful. Um, landing on Fantasy Island uh, offers weary travelers an opportunity for a long needed vacation. Hawaii and cyberspace. Uh, this piece began as a landscape, actually, <laughs> with my fellow travelers filter filtering down into the canyons and unfamiliar terrain, uh, not unlike Earth. I had three variations underneath this canvas be before this finished piece. Um, I painted over, uh, I was, I always photograph my work as I go along. <clears throat> and um, I was a little sorry, actually, that I painted over at least one of the variations beneath. Uh, I may try to do it again, but it was very spontaneous and it, uh, it was a landscape. And I started out in my art career doing Southwest uh, landscapes and uh, watercolors in oil and watercolors. And, uh, so I was 
always living in that landscape space, I guess. Um, I do, however, really like the textures in, in landing on Fantasy Island because of all of the layers beneath. It's a little rougher and raw uh, than uh, a window in time, which is a little neater. So there, there are differences there. A window in time, um, it offered an opportunity to reflect on what has gone before and what it has taken to land in a happy place again. I have completed one more small piece and another um, idea, probably a landscape that I, I may try to do. So we'll see what comes next, but the series is, is approaching conclusion. Um, but until then, my work expresses the underlying joy of beginning to open up again, seeing old friends again and meeting new ones, uh, going out to dinner, going to the gallery, which uh, some of us did on last Saturday. It was such a great experience to be out. We had masks on, but it was okay. Most of us have been vaccinated, so we could sneak them off every once in a while. And um, <clears throat> all spelling the end of our long, arduous, depressing uh, journey in isolation. So I loved keeping the same palette uh, in these two pieces that ended up almost being twins. I thought, wait a minute, um, but um, I think they're a nice pair. Uh, they're both acrylic on canvas, as you can see, 24 by 24. And they, they have collage elements, including snippets of the vintage uh, fabric from the Hill Tribe in Thailand that really anchors all of the work in the series that, that I've called Coming Together Again. Um, I can't conclude uh, without thanking our dear Petra. Without her, none of, none of this would happen. Um, she never misses a beat with her incredible curatorial skills. And to Jason, her, her life partner, for his phenomenal photographic and lighting skills that really bring all of these exhibits uh, to life at Gloria Delson Contemporary Arts and have been invaluable during, during the pandemic, of course. And then lastly, to thank everyone uh, who might be here tonight that was, that was invited, that they took time uh, to, to join us on a, on a holiday weekend. Uh, I'm glad it's recorded. I've had a couple of people reach out and, and say, oh, I couldn't come tonight, but I'm so glad it's going to be recorded and people do watch it. So I'm really glad we're doing this. I know, Petra, I know, I know. It was, it was a task, but I'm glad we're doing it. And uh, as she said, all the resident work in this ex exhibition is for sale. Uh, Petra is standing by uh, to let all her babies go to enthusiastic collectors. I'm, I'm very thrilled to to share that uh, the first two pieces I did in the series, the, obviously aren't in this bunch tonight, were taken home by, um, found a new home by a wonderful collectors. Thank you, Caldwells. And um, ongoing sales are, are really critical uh, to keeping this one of a kind uh, top notch. It's listed as uh, one of the 10 top contemporary galleries in, in Los Angeles, maybe even better than that to keep afloat. and ignite the artists, keep the artists ignited to who show here to keep on working. So thank you very much. Thanks, Suzanne, you're such an angel. As always, the, the check is in the mail. I'm sure you're gonna be hiring <laughs> in Tahiti anytime now. <laughs> I'm sending you. <laughs> God love you and, and thank you as much as I, um, you know, I, I sweat bullets thanks to you every time putting these presentations together. I always walk away feeling we did something important and I'm really grateful for that opportunity. I'm grateful that you made me put on my big girl pants and 
um, again, I like mixing metaphors, grow a pair. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I like wearing curls, but I can also be rather irreverent. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like elegance with a touch of salt. <laughs> no, no, seriously. I, I, you know, I wouldn't have started this without you. And uh, I'm so grateful. And I'm so grateful to you. Let's talk about you. Um, one of the things that has been so exciting, and, and all of you guys are part of our family. Our, our, our artist family, our gallery family. And what's been so interesting is that it's such a luxury is that in real time, we've been able to follow this particular series along as it's been created, starting with the turquoise pieces that, that went home uh, with the, the Caldwells and then the, the black pieces into this. And, and so what's so apparent is also the the movement into into joy you know from the black because the isolation is still there in the composition but the palette is becoming looser and, and more playful so it's it's a nod to we're not out of the woods yet you know we're still being careful but we're we're entering better times it's gonna get better it's, we're almost there and um so that's just been really amazing to be able to kind of watch this series as it's unfolding and um it, it i always want to encourage artists especially younger artists that i speak to 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 have the discipline to work in series as you were saying these twins were kind of their twins that were kind of creating themselves at the same time there's there's real value to that there's i don't think it's an accident that in the old school days uh, that's what artists had to do. They had to. They were forced to create in series until they really get to the point where they feel I've said everything I need to say in the yeah. series. There's, there's. It's like again, Richie, you'll appreciate this. It's like a Meisner exercise. You just don't know what's coming around the corner. <laughs> Three times you're drinking from a cup. No, I'm drinking from a cup. No, you're drinking from a cup. No, I'm. You just don't know what's going to happen. Um, it's, it's 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 so so important to um to trust and to not shortchange yourself to not assume that you've said everything because at the point when you've reached the breaking point and you feel like i have nothing else to say i have nothing else to give it's going to be something there even if it's the transition into the next series but there's going to be a discovery there um anyway thank you uh, Suzanne, as always, um, I have so much more to say, but I'll, I'll save it for the Q and A. Um, Thanks, Annie. Thank you. Um, now I have to bonk my way through the Suzanne Belcher. That was our dear Suzanne Belcher. All right, and now we arrive at uh, Ryan Lane, and um, this is a detail from his painting number forty which uh, we're so excited, also found a new home. Um, Ryan also can't be here tonight, so I'm going to introduce him to you um, via a little bit of a bio. Um, he's, as, I, as you're seeing here, displaying three paintings from this particular series this month at the gallery. And um, here goes. Ryan Lane is a professional painter and furniture maker who graduated from Wabash College in 1985 with a degree in fine art. Ryan has exhibited his paintings and furniture in both solo and group shows in numerous galleries, the Indiana Museum of Art and Wabash College. The paintings are clearly influenced by the techniques and tools that are part of the furniture making process. He says, I'm trying to capture a moment where a delicate balance is on the verge of collapse. The work has been described as landscapes, natural processes, or images of cellular activity, all hopefully el eliciting an emotive response. My hope is that you feel a very real formal tension and that is visually appealing and alive. A very real formal tension that is visually appealing and alive. It seems to me however, that I am painting events. And the events in the paintings of mine that I like the most 
it seems the stasis of the horizon is in jeopardy. So I thought that was really, really fascinating. And certainly a lot of concepts. Um, the man clearly likes patterns. And um, also he and I have a, had a nice chuckle at the fact that he said he, well, he said several things that I really love. He said he seeks to harmonize the disharmonious which I can see, even though I find these pieces quite harmonious. But he's always trying to explore the tension and flux versus stability. And it reminds me very much of what Richie was saying, actually, the, the changing, the movement. But the other thing he said, and this is where we have our little joke, is that he said he, he utilizes a mathematical intuition in terms of placement of color. And I had to tell him there is no such thing. There is no such thing as mathematical intuition. There's either intuition or there's math. The two will never meet ever, ever. But that's just my own personal um, vendetta. So he and I have arguments about that. But um, the result is really exquisite and so detailed. And if you at all have a chance, I encourage you to come in and see these works up close because the, the, the texture and the, the tools that have been used, the wood furniture making wood tools um, are just not visible in the digital image here. So um, therefore, come in, come in. Um, with that, we leave Ryan Lane and we move on to Stephen Schubert who I was so hoping he could be here tonight because he's um, a wonderful speaker um, but he can't be here tonight. So I'm gonna try my very best to, to do him justice. Um, this particular image is a detail from the painting we have on display this month. It's called Winter Pain. And uh, most of you by now will have become familiar with Stephen's work that is coated with a very, very polished uh, resin top coat. This, however, is one of the rare canvases where he did not cover it with a resin top coat and just allowed the, the texture to be classic. And um, I, I wish he could be here to talk about what inspired this particular painting tonight, but um, rather I'm going to take you into his process, which is also really interesting. Kitchen tools, foams, rags, boards, and just about anything from Home Depot can make interesting painting mates. Primarily, although, I use a spackle knife. Dragging, spraying, dripping, smearing, and scraping are all part of the process. Varying amounts of pressure applied with my spackle knife enables me to create some control over the haphazard nature of my approach. I lay down up to 15 layers of paint and frequently finish the piece with a resin top coat alternating this application with paint, resin, paint, resin numerous times renders a startling effect in which the paint layers appear to float above the other layers. This causes the light to be trapped between the layers and it gives a wonderful sense of inner illumination. And this is the part that I wanted to talk to him about because I certainly feel this painting also has that sense of inner illumination but I will have to, Stephen, if you're watching, maybe you can answer in the q and I wanted to ask, uh, to me, it's not an accident because again, fun fact, here's one of our fun facts, Stephen is an actor. And oh, I missed this with Richie. I was gonna embarrass you as well. Richie is also an actor amongst many, many other things. And so my question goes to both of you and we'll get back to this at the Q&A. Here's my question. And Terry, you too, for that matter, if you're, she just stepped out. Uh, given your performance background, does this influence your process of your visual process of painting? Richie, with you, I have a feeling it's being in the now. With Stephen, I know from my background with him that a lot of it has to do with the spiritual work that goes into training of being an actor and that the, the, the physical act of bringing the light into the painting is, is not just a physical act, it's also a spiritual act. Um, so those are all my questions and, and I apologize. I uh, usually have a more polished demonstration um, 
but maybe we can answer these questions with each other. Maybe I'll use that that quote from earlier and say, you know, Rich, like Richie's paintings, this is, I'm gonna leave that open-ended and ask you to complete that sentence. Maybe you can find the answer for me. Um, so there we have, this is uh, Winter Pain by Stephen Schubert. And this concludes our group exhibition resonance, which now of course brings us to the Delson Lounge and our solo act of the night, Cynthia Ann Swan, Deja Vu. You're gonna have to suffer through me pronouncing it correctly, Vu, because I happen to be able to do an umlaut. So, <laughs> I refuse to say Deja Vu, I'm gonna say Deja Vu. All right, so here we go. As I take you through our instruments, I wanted to read some show statement, which is as usually, as usual, exquisitely beautiful. Um, Déjà Vu is a limited retrospective of my work created in three of my earlier collections, Autumn Winter 2012, Black and White 2013, <clears throat> 2013. The work has been curated to share four cohesive characteristics, chronology, palette, presentation, and nostalgic reference. The title intends a double meaning, the literal experience of viewing these pieces with a sense of having seen them before, and the feeling <clears throat> of time and memory as emotionally charged moments of repetition. These three collections were created at three different times and embraced three different concepts. These one magical night of the Jellicle Moon and the celebration of winter beauty contrasted against the threat of its destruction and melting ice caps. What unites them is that they all represent a strong trigger for my own personal sense of déjà vu, back east winters of childhood memory. Experts tell us that memory, stress, and fatigue create the perfect storm for déjà vu. No wonder then, we are all part of this surrealistic collective reflection. The world has just passed through a tumultuous year of fear, loss, and sorrow. In the chaos, anger, and isolation, we have found ourselves grasping for bits of normalcy. The before times of memory, before the thick, this, sorry, before the sickness, before the death, before the disconnection. Have we been here before? Can we go back again? But we cannot go home again. All we have is now and now what? So with that, I would like to welcome and introduce to you Cynthia Ann Swan, modern abstract impressionist. So Cynthia, before we enter the series overview, would you explain to us what is a modern <clears throat> impressionist? Okay, so actually I'm the one that has, has sort of come up with that definition. I don't know if it's universally adopted, but I do think it fits me because modern would be because I'm using a lot of different media that I involve with my, my paintings. It's not a pure, pure thing with the glass. And I'm always inventing processes and pushing techniques as far as they can go, uh, using tools from other trays, uh, trades to, to manipulate the glass in different ways. So that's where the modern part comes from. Abstract, because I'm trying to strip out the literal and personal aspects of what I'm depicting so that it can be more easily adopted by the viewer. And so I'm trying to get to the essence of what it is I'm showing them just enough to be able to to communicate the idea, but not so much that it gets in the way of them bringing themselves to the viewing. And impressionist because 
above all, I'm trying to capture the experience and the, mo the emotion of the moment. It's not gonna be that way again. It was never that way before, but at that moment, it's perfect. So that would be my explanation of why modern abstract impressionist is what I think I am. <laughs> I unmuted myself because I had some background noise. I love it. I think it's a perfect terminology, but it was so rich that I wanted you to really take us into the different elements and how it applies to your work um, because it does. So um, now, we're going to move into the different collections and I'm going to turn it over to our, our master teacher and artist over here. We're gonna begin the Flix collection. Okay, so the Snowflakes collection is the first of the three. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about snowflakes. There are no actual snowflakes in snowflakes. Uh, the, the term was, one, because no two of them were alike, unlike my prior um, collections where I had a lot of commonality, there was really a lot of individuality in the pieces in Snowflake. And also because a friend of mine who was also an artist, um, hearing me sort of self-doubt and second guess myself, basically said, just, just do it, just dance little snowflake. So I, I decided I would just dance with this one. And that's a good lead in to the two pieces you're seeing now, because let me explain first how I work. Some of you already know this, but th for those of you who don't, my creative process is one of organization. I start with the main idea, and you can think of this as like a bubble chart where I have the main idea in the center, and then I have spokes out from that main idea, and then there are bubbles at the end of those spokes, each of which has a facet of the main idea that it's focusing on. And within that facet, which I call a series, there are individual pieces always an odd number, usually three, but can be five, can be seven, that have to relate to each other in at least three ways, but can also stand on their own. And above all, they all need to answer back to the main idea. So in terms of the snowflakes, this was the series name, which is part of the snowflakes. Snowflakes, as, as Petra just said, is really celebrating all that is winter. And for me, that's a lot. <laughs> I really miss the back East winters, but the backgrounds are, we make all of our own presentations. And so the presentations in the Snowflake collection um, are, are based on the aerial views of the uh, melting ice caps, the erosion of the, of the ice caps. And so all of those have that in common. Each one is a different photograph that I tried to emulate. And, and the, the backgrounds are like a caveat that as beautiful as winter is, we're not gonna have it if we don't do something about the global warming. So that's the main idea of snowflakes. The, uh, the first two pieces here are part of the nightclub series. And the idea was that at night, when nobody's looking and the wind is blowing through the trees, they make their own music, they become instruments, and they dance to their own music. So windy blues, you see all these strips of glass, and um, each one is individualized. Some look more like instruments than others, like clarinets and so on. But they're all wiggling, um, and, and they're dancing to their music. And then the other one was cool jazz and uh, cool because of the blue background, but, but all of those um, trees in that, in that piece are pretty much um, clarinets at this point. So the, the third member of that series was purchased. It was called Hepcat Coolsville. And it was one of my favorites because um, it had a lot of 
of retro patterning going on. It reminded me of some of the, the pieces that you'll see on the wall if you ever go to Palm Springs and you see some of that 50s memorabilia up there. And so it had that feeling. So had to be have cat cools go. The um, next slide is going to be the Snows of Lothlorien, which is technically a triptych. Um, this is a little reference. I do a lot of Tolkien references. And this is the Snows of Lothlorien and um, their peaceful hush, silver and gold, and sanctuary. They all have pure metals in them. The gold is actually gold, gold leaf crumpled up and balled in there. And there's uh, silver and there's also palladium, um, which is another metal. And these were very intricate to make. All of these components were made separately, fired separately, then coal work, um, sawed into different shapes and then refired back together again. It was, it was a lot of process going on. And they were done, the final fire was a contour, which means I left the texture going on, but there was a lot of full fusing going on before I did that. The next slide is gonna be the Winterlude series. Winterlude's was the piece that I feel when I'm out in the winter woods. I, I, I feel just a hush uh, a quiet and like a quietude space. So to me, Winterlude felt like a good description of that. Uh, there are three pieces in this, in this series and there's Night and Day and Ice, which is the one on the left. And that is actually like uh, a negative and a positive of the same image. The idea was this is a winter stream that's frozen and the left-hand side would be you viewing it at night. And the right-hand side is what it would look like in the daytime, but it's the same stream. And um, there's a lot of abstraction going on in that piece. Many layers, a lot of contour, um, all kinds of glass in there and a lot of texture. Guardians is the forest, the quiet forest, not the one dancing to the nightclub music, and these are like the stoic historical sentinel trees that have guarded the earth for such a long time. And they just quietly stand guard and they, they do their, their duty. And uh, this one has a, a shape that was formed on a, on a special mold that my mentor Boyce Lundstrom uh, gave me. And it's actually from a piece of corrugated roofing, but it, it gives it a, a little bit of a waviness to it that it wouldn't normally have. I deliberately did uneven amounts of glass on this so that when it does fire and slump, there's actually gaps within the surface. Um, that's all intentional, but that, that one is one of my, my favorite pieces. The next slide, is going to show you the, the last of the um, winter ludes, which would be for snow. That's the one on the left-hand side. And uh, if you see that in person, it doesn't really show up in the slide very well, but the top has a slight pale blueness to it. That's another abstraction of forest uh, after the first snow. And there's, uh, there's strips of copper and, and uh, special kinds of, of paper that I have put glass powders in and stuff that are fused inside of the glass, um, but it has a very textural quality to it. The one next to it is actually a different series, but it's the only one left. And when, when only one piece of a series is left, I call it an orphan. And so this is my orphan. It's right of spring and um, it is basically when the surface of, of the streams start to break up and, and uh, form ice, ice flows and stuff. And so that's, that is the, the point of melting in that piece. The other two pieces have sold and Petra is the one that sold them, both to two different people. 
uh, I believe one of them is living in Santa Fe and the other one is from LA. So that's where its, its siblings went to. Okay, the next slide. The black and white collection. Well, I happen to know that this collection is, is probably, probably Petra's favorite collection that I've done. Um, and in some ways, it's also my favorite collection. It's also the one I really, really had the hardest time doing and would never, ever want to do again. <laughs> and that is because I love color, love color. And this is not colorful. Um, I absolutely limited myself to a palette that was basically just a grayscale, mostly black and white and shades of gray in between. Um, I did that much like a photographer decides to shoot in black and white film because sometimes the color can override the emotion of the place and the true character is only really felt when you take the distractions away. And so that is what I tried to do with the black and white. I tried to take the distractions away and get you to see the stark reality, the beauty that I wanted to, to display. Um, technically, it was very difficult because I could not rely on color to, uh, to give me textural interest or, or any of those nice things that color tends to do. I only had texture and contrast. And to control the texture, I had to really, really be on my game in the kiln because Texture is all about time and temperature. And what you want to have happen as a process, you really have to control both of those things. And even then, sometimes the kiln gods have their own ideas, but <laughs> that is what this was all about. It was trying to get the, the drama and the, uh, the impressionist feeling that I'm going for um, over in just a really limited way of expression. The other thing I should say is that the concept of the black and white, uh, and I always need to have a concept that's a little whimsical. And this one was that all of the pieces in the black and white are showing you some aspect of a specific winter night. And it's a winter night that is the night of the jellical moon. And if you've ever seen musical cats, you'll know what a jellical moon is. It is the one magical night of the year when the, um, the god comes down, the cat god comes down, and he chooses one singular cat that he feels is the most deserving to achieve everlasting life. And not that I want to be a, a, a spoiler here, but most people probably already know the story to, to cats, so I will just tell you that um, the entire musical is about all these other cats trying to show off, trying to prove that they're the most deserving. And, and they are wonderful cats and they do all kinds of neat things. But there's one cat that isn't trying. And she's old and she's shabby and she slinks off in, into the shadows and tries to stay out of everybody's way. And they hate her. And the whole reason that that, that syndrome is occurring is because when she was a young cat, she wasn't nice. She was very um, vain. She, she looked down her nose at all the other cats and thought she was all it and, and special. And, and she was a glamor puss, literally. And, and she was just into herself and really didn't care much about anybody else. And so now that she's old and doesn't have her looks anymore, um, people resented how, how she treated them and so now they're returning the favor and they're not treating her very well either but here's the thing she knows why and she accepts it she owns it she knows it was because of how she treated them and she does not resent it she doesn't blame them she just figures this is what she deserves she should have known better when she was a younger cat and so all of this goes on and here is the spoiler alert. If you don't want to know, mute right now, because the one cat that turned out to be the most deserving was her. 
And the reason is because she learned the lesson and was now humbled by it. So the jellical cat I'm talking about is right there. She's on the far right hand side and very abstracted. But if, if you see her the way I see her, there is a black cat there and she's got her front paws on the ice. She's looking down at her own reflection. There is snow across her back and over her tail. And, and this, is, this is the jellical cat, reflections of a jellical cat. Now the other two on the other side, yeah, that's part of my virtual cow series. There were three, the white cow eating marshmallows in the snow was, was purchased from Petra on the very last day of the show when we were taking it down. And this young man, as I recall, came running in almost breathless because he was so afraid it was gonna be gone. He'd had to run home and measure. So he made sure he had room for it. And then he came in and, and, and he took it right then as we were taking it off the wall. So that's kind of fun. This, this series was whimsical for a different reason. The Virtual Cow series basically goes back to a discussion that John, my husband and I had about this, this guy who was trying to get ready for his own art show. And he was staring at this huge white canvas and somebody came in and said, when are you gonna get started? Isn't the show coming up? He says, I've already started. He says, what do you mean? He said, well, look at it. It's white, um, what a white cow eating marshmallows. marshmallows in the snow. and. So from that, I said, boy, wouldn't it be fun to do uh, a, a series like that? And so I did. So the white cow is gone, but the black cow is eating licorice in the dark. And the black and white cow is eating Oreos in the fog. And the thing is, it's a virtual cow series because there's a cow in there. And, and John had a blast. Um, telling people basically where the cow was and asking them like a where's Waldo if they could find the cow. I had to put a cow in it. I mean, I just had to. So I got, I got a stamp that happened to be of a cow jumping over the moon. And so into each of those, I did use the stamp taking glass powder and stamped them in there. They're almost negligible because I use the same color glass powder of course, as the piece is. So the black cow is black. But if you look closely, you'll find it. Okay, the next slide. All right, this one's got my favorite piece in it. All right, so this is depicting the landscape, the surrounding landscape on the night that the jellical cat gets chosen. So on the left-hand side, you see Silver Fork. I see that as an aerial view, like a bird's eye view, looking down on the frozen river where it forks around an island that you see in that little V thing at the top. Now, I always title my pieces and I ask Petra to please put the titles up because I like the title to be an introduction from the, the viewer to the piece. Um, several reasons for that. First of all, a lot of people may not be familiar with abstract art and they don't know where to start in terms of trying to figure out what's there. And so I try to make it just a little bit easier. I give them like a hint with, with the title, but then they can go where they want to. In fact, I hope they do because I take what I think and what I'm feeling and I put it into the piece but what comes out on the other side is like letting your child grow up and then he meets a whole bunch of different friends and they have their own discussions and their own languages and they wound up knowing things about each other that you never knew. And so my, my greatest joy is when someone doesn't see um, the river with the frozen island in the middle, but they see something else just as magical and that's what it means to them. Nightwood in the middle is my favorite. And I think that's somewhat because of its visual, but it's also because it was so difficult to make and I was so happy when it turned out. Um, there's a lot of linear stuff going on. Um, the inside obviously is the night forest and that's got five different layers of glass going on in it. And if you stand in front of it for real, you can sort of look deeply into the forest and you'll see how there's trees that go back inside. 
and the top has a lot of texture. And then the black surrounding it is all about texture. It's an abstraction of the same trees and that's got texture going on. And then the back panel, which is steel, um, the, the black lines you see were not painted on. I actually put an acid down and, and had those create the lines of the, of the trees. And then I daubed it off here and there to make the, the texture of the tree bark going on. And that was, I don't know how many fires that was. It had to at least be five or six. The middle part was done by itself and the outer frame was done by itself. And then in the end, and when I was doing the outer frame, I had to put a material in the middle to hold the hole open so it didn't all flow together. And then at the very end, I took that block that I'd fired before and I set it into the center hole. And then around the outside of that, I put um, frit, which are little crunched up pieces of glass to be like a lacy ice border. And I just prayed when I did that last fire that I didn't lose all the texture I was trying to get. And I didn't, and I was really happy about that. So that's Nightwood. And then the last one, the one on the right-hand side is Mystic Intersections. I see that very much as a landscape, a winter landscape. And these are abstracted trees that are sort of close to you and rocks along the shore. And then there's a very wide stretch of frozen water of some sort. And just the hint of the uh, land on the other side of that lake or river, whatever it is. So, so that has to do with this. And they're called diamonds in the dark because of the snow and how it glistens and stuff with any kind of light that's on it in the wintertime. Okay, moving on. Next slide. Next slide. She did move. Oh, she did. Okay. Thank you. All right. So this is um, also the black and white. This is a three component series, which sort of goes together as a trip type. And this one is called the uh, Black Ice series. If you've ever been back east, I have a dog nosing me right now. So if you happen to see a nose in, in the picture, it's just Simba. Well, he came in, he wants to let me know he's here. I knew it, but anyway. <laughs> um, all right, so black ice happens back east, usually on the roadway. You have to be careful because it melts in the daytime and then it freezes and you can hardly tell it's there, but it's a very easy way to wipe out. So this is the black ice uh, series. And the two pieces on the outside, uh, the one on the left is called Winterberry White. And the one on the left, or on the right is Eagle's wings. Did I just say them backwards? No. I didn't. Okay. I get right and left confused. And in the center, that's my favorite part. It, that piece is called Afterlife of Leaves. And what I intended with the middle is what happens with leaves when they are at the end of fall and they, they get all soggy and wet and then it freezes overnight. And this is what happens to the leaves. It's their afterlife after they've died and fall into the ground. And so that's the afterlife of leaves. I see an eagle head and wings in the right hand one. And I see some sort of berries and, and fruit and stuff in the other one. So that's where the names came from. But I just think that they're a very, very nice um, little grouping together. And I like the textures and, and that's kind of it for that one. <laughs> Next. Okay, the Autumn Winter Collection. There's only one grouping that's in that, and this is it. It was actually a very large collection. A lot of the pieces have sold from that, and there's a lot of orphans going on. But this little group here, I originally did it as a series, and then I made it a trip kit, triptych. And this is another Tolkien reference because this is once again, the forest of Lothlorien, but it's specifically the elven wood. The elves are the ones that uh, lived in the forest of Lothlorien. And people may not know this, but elves travel in their dreams. That's how they get from one place to another. 
they they do it in dream time. You might think of it as like out of body ex experiences. Wait a minute. <clears throat> Explain. <clears throat> So these um, pieces are, uh, you can imagine them as a uh, slice out of the center of a trunk vertically. And um, so there, there are three different views of um, the center trunk and on the right hand side is, is the glowing heart of the whole tree. You, okay. That's good, thank yeah. you. <clears throat> I have a condition called laryngospasm and sometimes the nerve blocks off my breathing and that just happened for a minute. I'm fine, but if that happens, I have a wonderful husband who's extremely aware of everything that I do and helps me a lot. And so he is always, he has to read everything that I have prepared and he needs to know on a moment's notice that he's got to step in. So thank you, John, for doing that. <clears throat> Anyway, so, so the, this is just a little fanciful thing I did to represent the, the hearts of the trees. And it, it's at night because that's of course when the elves are, are uh, doing their thing and they all have dichro in them. And it's like secret mystery color because unless the light hits it just right, you don't even see it. But then when it does, it's wow, it's right there. Um, I want to give, Petra um, credit for the fact that these three pieces under her tutelage here were, were purchased. And so um, they will now have, they've been adopted and they will be living with another, another person. They've lived with me long enough. So thank you, Petra. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> This one isn't an orphan. It never had a family. It never was part of a series. It was a one of And it was originally done for a New Year's Eve party that was going to have an auction. And the theme was um, like art deco and um, that kind of thing. So I created it specifically for that. And then the auction didn't happen. So it, it is an autonomous piece, rare. Um, I usually don't work that way. But what I did do in this piece, which I call the Gatsby after party, is I did a lot of research, even though this wasn't a full collection, and I researched my collections for like years, um, but I did have to research this for the patterning to make sure I was being authentic. And I read all about Gatsby, I actually reread part of Gatsby, which I'd written, uh, read before. And that whole thing of how the, the decadence and the opulence of, of the period wound up just going out of control. So I, I used real gold in this piece and real silver. And again, palladium. And along the side, there are three blocks of dichroic glass. But what I did was a lot of techniques in here. I stamped, I stenciled, I hand drew a bunch of stuff, I splattered, and then I mounted it to an actual gallery wrapped canvas, which I painted with acrylic paint as an extension of the glass, continuing those um, retro art deco patternings that is in textured paint on the outside. And I saw this as basically the heyday of the Gatsby period. And it just basically started to, to become chaotic and decay as everything that is done as an overindulgence tends to do. And so the excess caught up with them. So it's kind of exploding and, and deteriorating at the end, but um, that's Gatsby after party. So that kind of wraps up the idea of this. Um, again, the deja vu part was these pieces have been seen before by some people. And uh, so therefore it was literal, but I really was thinking in terms of the before times and the current times, which are now. And basically 
what I was thinking about specifically was that the issues that were prevalent in the before times, before COVID, have really come back to haunt us now that we're in after COVID. It's just that they are now being somewhat obscured by different veils. But something will happen and you feel like it's happened before because it has. It's just called something new or it's in a new place. But these things keep repeating. These social issues keep showing up again. And so with all the insecurity that we've all experienced, um, I think that even though this is a joyful time that things are recovering, I think it's also important that we are ex experiencing this deja vu. And maybe it's the first time we've had an opportunity to look at it. And so this phenomena, um, while it's uncomfortable, it may be really useful for us moving forward that as a collective, um, spirit that maybe we can start working on these things that seem to keep coming back over and over again. So I'm done. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> what, a, what an exit. <laughs> so I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Uh, as you know, I, I really, really loved having this show back and kind of bringing back what I call Cindy's greatest hits. And <laughs> you truly are an alchemist in the truest sense of the world. word. You are artist, you are scientist, and you are visionary. And I, I am just always amazed at the breadth of your, your talent and vision and love of detail. And, you know, it's interesting. I went back and read some of the um, the coverage we had for your early shows. And in one of the pieces, it, it talks about what you already touched on, which is, you, you know, sort of a, a fearless eye towards discovery and invention and all of that. But one of the things that we wrote was that, you know, you chose the medium, but it seems very much this medium chose you. And I just, I don't think there's a truer thing that could be said. You really are this medium. And, and I just um, thank you so much for, for bringing it into our homes and bringing it to our awareness and advancing it in a way, you know, that it is now an art discipline, um, an art medium, which it, it really wasn't that struggled so long to get here. So anyway, thank you for all that you are and all your research. This completes our solo show, completes both of our presentations of our group show Resonance and Cynthia and Swan Deja Vu. <laughs> um, so now please join us for a q and A. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and um, then you'll see the artists up close and personal. Uh, here we go. Everybody hold your breath. Should I do it? Yeah. Did it? It's gone? Oh, I think so. I can get out of this. Hi. Okay. So now, here we are. We're going to have a Q&A. Let's see if we have any questions. This is always the fun part. Let me go to the chat. I don't see any questions in the chat button, but that doesn't mean anything. I'm gonna to go to the Q&A, open, answer, dismissed, open. Okay, so this did this to me once before and it showed absolutely nothing. And then all of a sudden there were 20 questions. So bear with me. Um, meanwhile, we're gonna uh, move forward with some other questions. So Adria, the first one. You said you were all about color, right? Yes. So if you were forced to choose a favorite color, which one would it be? You see the wall behind me? <laughs> Purple. <Yeah. laughs> my, my whole apartment is lavender. My ceilings are purple. I feel that is my deepest. Uh, I'm also an Aquarian. I don't know if that has anything to do with it. So, um, that is a, a purple vibe, absolutely all the way. Love it. Yeah. 
probably the color that that is one of the really dominant colors in the background of the trees are melting. Number two. That is true. That, that is true. Really rich royal violet. So thank you. Thank you for thank that. Thank you. <laughs> the uh, next question would be for Anthony Caldwell. Um, Anthony, your angles are very dramatic and they seem to recall movies of the noir genre. Yes. yes. Vertigo. Are you influenced in your compositions by movies, specifically noir movies? Uh, short answer, yes. Uh, they are very influential for a variety of reasons. They're very visually dazzling and kind of draw you into the, the landscape around you. But another reason too is that uh, when you're next to a, a building, a tall building, they're very high. So part of the extreme angles is to emphasize that height and to begin to get the viewer a little more connected with what it's like to actually stand in front of one of these very, very high buildings and either look up or conversely, if you're on a roof, look down. Well, you know, it's interesting because the, 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 the looking down effect that you did is very voyeuristic. Oh yeah, it's, it's a rear window for sure. Yeah. It's, it's when you really go there, when you're going into like, who am I? Why am I here? Why am I looking at this? Like, am I supposed to be looking at this? Am I allowed? Are my lights off? Am I, am I, where did, how did I get here? Well, so, you, it's, it's funny you say that because uh, my latest camera actually can resolve things much, much better than my older cameras. So I always have to kind of look at the imagery first and go, did I catch anything I shouldn't have? That we don't want to reproduce. Yeah. So far, so good, though. So good. Good. Um, okay, so the next question uh, goes to Terry. And Terry, so this was one of the fun facts that I omitted. I, I have to, I have to share this. You can't blame me. <sighs> no. Why my artists are the most interesting people on the planet. Terry, before becoming a professional artist, would you please tell us what you did for a living? Yes. I was a beautiful dancer. And? <laughs> I was a clown with, the, with Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell people I was a beautiful dancer and they don't believe me. So I don't know why. You but, 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 but I totally would believe that. But. So, so you have got to obviously share some something about that with us. Well, uh, I was a theater arts major in college, and uh, I was very interested in physical theater. I liked slapstick. I'm probably one of the few women in the world who actually love the Three Stooges. Um, but uh, you know, I was very athletic. I was a gymnast. I did fencing, all kinds of things. And uh, my one of my professors said, you know, there's this school in Florida that will, you know, kind of move you forward if you're interested in doing this. And it was Ringling Brothers Clown College. So I applied and I auditioned and I got accepted. And um, after eight weeks of basic training, I um, I was going to go back home and I was offered a class to teach, but they offered me a contract to travel with the circus. So I was 19 years old and I was able to see the entire United States, you know, some major, major cities and some not so major cities and uh, did that for two years before I decided to land in LA where I then lived for the last, I don't know where I lived for about 35 years, but I'm not there now and I miss LA. I miss you all in LA. Um, yeah, that was, that was uh, quite an amazing experience. And uh, my children will always say, hey, mom, you know, you, you are the only mom at school who was a circus clown. <laughs> and they're very proud of that. I bet you're invited to all the picnics and say, can you juggle this? <laughs> yeah. But my husband's funnier than I am. He's a, a stand-up comic. So uh, what are the chances of a stand-up stand comic marrying a clown? I don't know. Pretty good, maybe. <laughs> I think it's an 
make for a really interesting movie starring Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's got to, that could either be the most hilarious Thanksgiving ever or. Well, pretty dramatic. The turkey, you know, shoo, flying across the room and. Love it. Love yeah. it. In our home, we do. The, the, the next question, and I'm going to field this to all of you actors, even though I think the only other current actor is Richie, um, oh. which is, does your, your process as a performer influence or inform in any way the process that you apply to your visual process, your visual oh. Richard, did you want to answer that or do you want me to answer? <laughs> <laughs> I started out with Cirque du Soleil back in oh, 1998 in, in Canada. Really? And uh, I, yeah, I, I ushered for six years. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Um, you know, it's weird because uh, starting out in theater, very traditional, but Chekhov, it's Strindberg, it's Meisner, it's, you know, it's all of them, you know, and you learn your craft that way. And then I was more uh, later on, and I also loved uh, Commedia dell'arte, and I loved slapstick. Anything that was done well, even though it was bizarre, if it was done well, I appreciated it. But uh, my performance later on was, I was more observational as an actor. I would go and sit in the streets in the city and I, instead of working inside out, I worked outside in. I looked at characters that I would read the script, see what kind of individual that was, and I would go off into, the, you know, wherever it was I went. And I would just sit there and I'd watch. It's like people would feed pigeons, you know, and I would feed visually looking at people. And I looked the way this one walked, this one the way they, you know, hunched over, this one the way they would have a tick or something. And I would look at that person and I would incorporate it and make some kind of composite. And then I would incorporate it with the lines and I would go back into it then. But a lot of things I did later on was a lot of improv you know, improvisation. It was, um, so for me, it was, you know, bam, it had to happen right then and there. And um, that was a way for me to stay really authentic. I had problems later on because I, I might have given a, a given a good performance, you know, and people would come up and I, after the show, I go, yeah, I suck. I mean, I just really, I would sit there and I go, you know, no, I was, I wasn't true to myself. It wasn't authentic. It wasn't, it wasn't, re it was technical. Technically, it was really good, but internally, for what it was to build and be that character, I felt that was a that was phoning it in in a different way for me. So I had to work a lot of different ways maybe the add and the adhd and the hbo and all <laughs> whatever i had going on in my head um you know I, I it was probably just the way i had to find out how to survive you know either getting through school sports or it, it was just how i navigated through life a lot of times it was um extremely beneficial and the payoff was great and other times it was extremely painful you know, and disastrous. <laughs> so, but that's always been my life. There is no middle ground for me. It's black or white, no gray. So these days I look for the balance. That's why I go out in nature and I find it that way. So. Well, you know, if I may interject in listening to you, I feel like I extrapolated your looking, your seeing. I think you carried that over. The same way that you went mm. out and you looked and saw the character. That's the same thing you described about going into nature now and really looking at the scene and what are the components and what is the sense memory of that experience. So mm. actually you described it also when you came to the gallery and you said how you look at the other artworks that you're engaging with, how you see. I think that is possibly the crossover in the process. Mm. Just in listening. Mm, thanks um, for clarifying that for me. Really, <laughs> how much do I owe you for that session? <laughs> to listen to you guys, and then I, I'll never forget. I had an artist who brought in a whole series of work, 
and it was in the old gallery space and it filled the whole gallery and she just said yeah these pieces are just completely unrelated and um and I said really and she told me the story because they started out very you know tempestuous and really you know you're raw and emotional and then they got very quieter and quieter and quieter and became very very still and then they started building up some movement again and she had told me that she just lost her mom to cancer and that these paintings were created during that period of this incredible illness and the pain and the suffering and then the fading away and then the loss thereof and then starting to kind of re-engage in life and building again and I looked at her and I said you're telling me you don't see that? You don't see that on those canvases? And she just kind of said, huh, I guess I, guess I didn't, you know? And, and that's, I think, part of the, the dichotomy of you guys are so close to it, you're so in it, that sometimes it does take the observer, the person who's not in it to, to step back and to see the work and to, to, to connect the dots. Um, Anyway, sorry for that aside. Uh, Terry, we'll get to your uh, performance. Does your performance background inform you later? Because I want to be fair to everyone. Um, so I guess the next question would go to Cindy Swan. So Cindy, uh, at some point you described the relationship between glass and yourself. You know, certainly as uh, initially in the brainstorming process, very intuitive and then very restrictive, very scientific and specific because it must be controlled. But you said it's like a dance and that at some point the glass it leads or you both take turns leading and yielding. And so I was going to ask, who do you find does more? Do they, like, talk to me more about that dynamic. Who leads more, who yields more? definitely the glass leads uh -huh. um, even when you don't want it to <laughs> um yeah you you can only do just so much when the glass is cold mm -hmm. um because maybe people don't know how film form glasses is, is accomplished you assemble it in a cold state um preparing for what that state is going to be once it goes through its its change in the kiln uh, when when it hits the heat because what i do is called kiln formed glass but it wasn't always called that it's been called fused glass it's been called warm glass warm because it was in a kiln not being blown in a 2400 degree furnace but the buzzword now is kiln formed. And I actually think that that probably is better because there's so many different processes you can accomplish in a kiln with glass just by manipulating the temperatures and stuff. And um, so, yeah, but in any case, the heat always does form it. So I think that where it was most evident with where the glass leads is in glass blowing which I did have to learn how to do. And I had to teach it to freshmen when I was in college. And I really, really, really did not enjoy that because the glass is very, very hot and I'm heat sensitive. And you have to move very quickly um, to not get injured or have it break and fall off. And so, so there the glass is absolutely leading and you can't even set the tempo of it. But even with what I do, the glass, the glass still has a mind of its own. And um, it is, it's gonna be what it wants to be in the end. You, you are just guiding it. You're creating certain avenues of direction that you hope it will follow. But sometimes it doesn't. And, uh, and as my mentor, sorry, hold on, hold on just a minute. We we have an Airbnb and uh, our Airbnb guests just walked back by and the dogs were announcing that I have dog bells, not doorbells. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I guess that's a long answer to how the glass winds up being being in control. So love it. Very, very good. Very beautiful. Um, the, the next question goes to Suzanne. 
Suzanne Belcher, your energy is simply astounding and inexhaustible. Where do you take, where, from, from whom did you inherit your passion? Where do you take it from? How do you maintain it? What, like, from where do you source your incredible energy and curiosity and passion? Well, I, like tonight, I don't feel all that energetic at the moment. But um, my father was an artist by avocation. So, you know, I definitely got some of his genes, but unfortunately he passed away before he really experienced me as an artist. Mm -hmm. um, I think he would have been proud of me. I know. Uh, my motto in the last few years as I'm growing older and getting gray uh, is that I'm going to dance as fast as I can, as long as I can. So, you know, people say, how do you do it? You know, you're in all these shows and uh, it's not an ego thing. It's just when you're doing art, it's never been about selling, but it's nice if somebody, you know, loves your work enough to take it home. It's about if you're doing it, you want to show it to have someone else appreciate it and see something in it. And if they decide to take it home, it's the biggest honor in the world that they, you know, um, experience something that's special to them. I'm a Gemini and I'm a double Gemini. So, uh, you know, by nature, um, everything I do is eclectic. I mean, I, I, I want to try this and I want to try that. And it, it was really hard for me to be focused, to stay into something. And I think art is probably the longest career I've ever had. I have done many, many things. I've reinvented myself many times. Uh, <clears throat> I have nothing um, to regret in life. I started out working after graduating from college as a secretary. And I've always ended up being sort of on the forefront of new ideas. Um, when I worked at UCLA uh, Extension for 10 years, I I coordinated and at the end helped develop courses for physicians and allied health professionals and the general public. So health has always been a factor for me. I'm also a, a health care provider, which I have been many, many years with my mother, my aunt, my cousin, my husband. Uh, so I have to keep going. I know that I can't stop. Um, and my art has been, you know, I've loved to try different things. I love uh, trying different mediums. I started out as a, as a Southwest oil and watercolor painter, as I said, and got seduced by so many different mediums. Um, I studied with Catherine Chang Lu for a number of years, and she forced me to get focused. And so for two years, she said, I want you to do nothing but black and white, mm -hmm. uh, these Im image transfer collages that I did. She said, nobody's done anything like that. And that's all I want you to do. But oh, like Adria, oh my God, I was a colorist by nature. And I did it though. Uh, I forced myself to do it and stay in that. It got me focused. Um, and then I had to go back to color and branch out. But my underlying nature is environmental. Uh, I love our planet. Um, I want to see it healed. Um, so a lot, well, really most of my art has an underlying environmental uh, preservationist aspect to it. Um, I put my own shadow image into it as a sort of an existential uh, observer and participant in my work uh, to always uh, be conscious about it. And, um, you know, I've done Tai Chi, I've done, uh, I studied with a healer for uh, a number of years, have done Reiki, I've traveled, I started a new age travel business with a, with a friend and we took trips all over. Anyway, I've done a lot. So. Amazing. Amazing. Well, that, that brings me into one of the questions I was going to throw out to everyone. Um, but I, I, I have to read some of the thing, comments that have come in so far, because I think 
I'm afraid we're gonna, it's gonna take off. Um, so very quickly, I just wanna say, uh, I feel like you, we're gonna circle back to that. This is a question for, for hold on. First, first it was a comment, sorry, I'm all over the place here. <laughs> and there's a chat window and I'm going crazy. Um, okay, there's a comment from Jamie Jones to all of you artists, all very beautiful and intriguing pieces. Uh, there's a comment from Rick Friesen to everyone. Not a question, but a comment to Anthony. You are right that in your pieces, you do not reveal the software you use, but it feels like a painting. Very individual, not just Photoshop filters. Right? Okay. Yes, correct. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I also, I had one from Crystal Michelson earlier. She just said, I don't have a question, but I just want to say, I'm sorry I got here late. It's beautiful and I love all of you. I know you guys know her, so I wanted to make sure you heard that. Um, okay, then there was a question to, where did it go? For Terry, how does being a clown influence your art? I think this is so fast. I think this is so fascinating as is your work. That is the comment. Thank you, that's very kind. Um, I'm not sure that the circus directly affects my work, but I have a very large case of wanderlust. Mm. And having been in the circus and traveled all over the country made me just want to travel more and more and more. And so I think my work is more informed by the travels that I have been fortunate enough to, to go to and less about the circus. I think it seeps in. And I did have a, a show a few years ago called, um, oh, what was it called? Confetti Circus. And it was um, mostly bright colored paintings. And it was as if I had tapped into that time of my life. Um, so I, I think that just um, anything an artist does is somehow going to seep into the psyche of the artist, whether it's travel, you know, with Richard and nature and, um, it's just, uh, it's bound to just get in there. So I'd say that the circus is in there, but maybe not in a way that is real obvious. Yeah, wonderful. Um, uh, the, the, okay, so here's the, here goes to back to my, my fun fact addiction, because now you guys, <laughs> I'm gonna borrow this from a fellow curator whom I adore, her name is Kate Stern. And um, basically it's the, the tell me something I don't know, give me a fun fact about yourself, something we didn't know before. The way she phrased it, I thought really kind of opened up the creative thinking, which was, tell me something about yourself that sounds 100% made up, but is 100, that sounds completely made up, but is 100% true. <laughs> Go out now. You're muted. I can't hear you. I'll mute myself. Okay, I'll tell you something that you can believe or not. I collect stamps. What? <laughs> is, that, is that true or I false? I, and I think this is bullshit. I don't think you collect stamps. I think you sell stamps. <laughs> what the hell? That's amazing. I actually do collect stamps. And I have amassed a collection of stamps that uh, I don't know what to do with them. I have collected stamps since I was a little girl. <laughs> I like it. Well, I, I can tell you something that... Um, when I was looking for a place to paint as a, a young mother, I ran into Suzanne at Kinko's and she was making Xerox copies of her paintings. And I said, what are you doing? That stuff is gorgeous. And she turned me on to where she had been taking classes at every woman's village in Sherman Oaks. 
And that just got me taking three classes a week. And I'm now I'm here. Wow. Oh my God, I remember that. Was it supposed to be false or was it supposed to be true? I'm not sure. <laughs> that was true. That was true. Yep. That was true. Yep. I love you, Adrian. <laughs> the, the, the reveal here is your art career started in the Kinko's coffee shop. <laughs> not exactly, but my adult art career. There you go. Okay. <laughs> your professional adult art career began. Thank you. Exactly. Okay. And here we are together. And here we are. It's fabulous. Is, and well, there's a few of us. There, and Suki with and Sylvia. Sylvia. Mm -hmm. All in the same group from yeah. our child. The we book. learned we learned how to do everything. We learned together. how to do everything. We took three classes. Okay. We went to okay. figure drawing, oil painting, and watercolor. Um, it was a crash course in how to be an artist. Yeah, it was like yeah. a college. Education. But yeah. we also learned how to curate a show, right. to hang a show, right. uh, to get venues, to exhibit our work, this is all uh, get portfol portfolios together. Uh, we learned how to do everything. And I think Petra really appreciates some of that. <laughs> I really do. I, because I, I, we come organized, don't we? Completely professional, completely prepared. You think of everything. And it is just, um, and again, Cindy, you, you also, down to Cindy, you were such a lifesaver in preparing the script for all of you. All of those statements that you guys send me, and Cindy, your, your show statement, it allows me to use that to then distribute it over the images and try to create a script. I, I couldn't have written it from scratch, you know? So um, thank you. Yeah, you guys are all so, so wonderful and prepared. And you're getting off the scot-free give us something give you something well first off susan i collect stamps too so <laughs> you're the only one <clears throat> okay so we have something to talk about we have something to talk about that's right amongst all the other things we have to talk about <laughs> at ucla um, we are <laughs> that's right um okay i spent a week once in egypt in a trench reading newspapers from world war ii true or false True. Yeah, it's true. It was a trench on an archaeological dig, and we came across what looked like was an old World War II fox uh, hole that intersected with our trenches. And so we were going through it, looking at all the wonderful memorabilia from the British troops that had been parked in it some time ago. Wow. Did you go through any of the pyramids? Oh, yeah. I've been to the pyramids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Me too. So we have to talk about that. Let's talk about that. See, the list is getting longer. We're, we're going to need a separate <laughs> webinar for it. Special guided tour. Nobody else went, but our little group. The inner, the inner lives of, the, of artists, the previous, it, the previous lives and inner lives of artists. It's a whole other virtual exhibit. Um, Richard, you're, you, you kind of led us with a lot of really great uh, factoids, but is there anything that we don't know? Anything that would surprise us? Like... Um, Kabuki. Every winter, I tie flies. <gasps> you fly? Yeah. I tie flies. Entomology, I tie flies. Bugs that live under the water in, in the air. <laughs> I also have doodle which I talk to animals. Wow. I might have might to not. Talk I'm guessing those are both true. You asked me which question. Which one first? Uh, Doodalintilitis. Easy for me to Again? say. Is that what you said? Doodalintilitis? What? Do, wasn't both, Doolittle yeah. the one who talks to animals? I do talk to yeah. animals. Yeah. I, yeah. I feel like I have a... Yeah. Gotcha. That's true. Now, what's okay. the, you want to know if tying flies every winter is true? Yes. You're fishing. It's false. I no. do it every other winter. Oh. Yes, and it's correct from fishing. It's exactly okay. right for fishing. Okay. I buy that. <laughs> I do tie flies. <laughs> and the next show I do with Petra, I will show you one of those pieces that I've created. Cool. Okay. Hey, I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> I'm sure you can. <laughs> okay. I, I, I've got one that you can decide if it's true or false. Okay. 
I have been to Tahiti 15 times. <laughs> I will say yeah. true on that one. Yeah. <laughs> in your mind, in your mind, I knew that one. 20 times. <laughs> I have a feeling Suzanne would place. <laughs> she, she's just laughing. That's because. No, she, I, I know. But she's sitting in the gallery, obviously. <laughs> She's not. That's a visual background. Oh, that's funny. It's a trick. Yeah. Ah. So I have to. I have to apologize. I I must go. go. I have to go. That's and right. I love all of you. That what? What are you doing here? You were supposed to be gone a long time ago. I know. I think they've gone right. to dinner without me, but I have to go see. <laughs> Join anyway, I could not leave this, Terry. It was so wonderful to see you, and. Uh, Everyone was wonderful. So thank you for letting me be part of the family. I love you. Good night. Have a good Patrick. weekend. Thanks so much. Everybody too. Stay safe. You too. Have fun. We should probably take that also and wrap up. I'm going to read just a few more uh, comments that have come in. Uh, Jason Lucio, who of course photographs our show, just wrote, I love, love, love lighting and photographing all of your works. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you. And he does a damn good job. Yes, he does. Uh, Siri France, also one of our dear artists, wrote, thank you all. What a beautiful show. I came late and I'm afraid I have to leave now, but I love seeing everyone and um, on such great form. Thank you, Siri. Very, very sweet. Uh, Want to make sure I don't leave. Okay, I think we've covered it all, which brings me to my closing, which is, I would like to extend, um, first of all, to you guys, the artists. This is what I have to say, oh, as the bus goes off, hold on. Um, you know, what I ask of an artist when I engage with their, what I call the reflection, with their self-expression, is how will you bring me inside? Where is our common humanity? Help me see the world through your eyes, even for a moment. I want to feel what you are feeling. Even better, tell me something I didn't know. Help me understand or experience something that changes me. And all of you have done that. So I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for changing me, for teaching me, and for moving me, help me feel. So God bless you. Big, big kiss, big thanks to you all. Um, special thanks to our, uh, our, our, our double superhero here, artist and webinar master, Anthony Caldwell, for once again, graciously hosting this webinar and holding my hand through the nervous breakdowns. Um, last but not least, a huge thank you to Jason Ruscio for the incredible lighting and the photography without literally without which the works would not be visible and I could not do these slideshow presentations for the virtuals. Um, and lastly, thank you all who are still out there. Thank you for joining us tonight and um, be safe, be good to yourselves, be good to each other until we meet again. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Petra. Thank you. Bye.